Okay. Let's take a few moments to worship the infinitely compassionate one, the omniscient one, Supreme Buddha. To do this, may you all be upstanding and, and recite the Namaskara with me. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arhato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arhato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arhato Samma Sambuddhasa Okay then, you may all be seated. Today we will be talking about an Arhat, who was the foremost monk in uttering peons of joy. His name was the most venerable Pindola Bharadwaja. So let's go back, back to the time of the Buddha. So, a hundred thousand eons ago, in the time of the Buddha Padmuttara, Pindola Bharadwaja was not a human back then. He was a lion. He lived in a cave on top of a mountain. It was a cave under a massive rock. And this lion was a very fierce lion. When he roared, the whole jungle shook. All animals would go straight into their nests, straight into their dens, straight into their homes. And if they had doors, they would lock them. But not only animals. This lion had a reputation that made even humans scared. Men were scared of this lion. No one dared to go near his cave. And especially no one dared to go inside. This is where the lion lived. All by himself. A lone hunter. So one day, the Supreme Buddha, the Buddha Padmuttara, looked through his divine eyes to see if out of his compassion he can help anyone. You see, that day, the Buddha Padmuttara saw the lion. So this lion had enough merits to go into the heavenly plains if the Buddha interfered. So that morning, he went round for arms and at the same time the lion went out to hunt, to eat its breakfast. So the Buddha Padmuttara went round begging for arms and after having his meal, he went to this forest. Men, women, children would see the Buddha go into this forest and warn him. Oh, Venerable Sir, in that forest there's a, a lion. The lion will harm you, will eat you. Please, Venerable Sir, don't go. But the Buddha isn't someone who is scared. His mind set on helping this lion. He goes forth into the forest. He goes forth into the cave as well. So covering the entrance of the cave was a massive rock. This is a Buddha, remember? He's got supernatural powers, right? So he was able to push this massive rock aside. This rock was big and heavy. No human could push it. And so he went inside the cave and using his supernatural powers, he levitated in a sitting position and started to meditate. So the lion didn't know anything about this. He didn't know that the Buddha had invaded his house, his home. And so carrying his prey, he went to the entrance of the cave. Now, we all know the story of Goldlocks and the Three Bears, right? So just like Goldlocks went into this Three Bears house, and the Three Bears found their door open and was suspicious, the lion was the same. The lion saw that the door was open, the massive rock, a rock that no human, no, not, not many animals can open, had been rolled to a side. Someone has entered my cave. Now just like you and I, when someone has 
trespassed into our property. Well, it's the same way that the lion felt as well. So it was angry. So this cave had footprints. Very special footprints. But obviously the lion didn't care. Someone has trespassed into his house. So he started to follow these footprints. So one foot, one foot to the next. The lion followed it. Until the footprints disappeared. There was no more footprints after a certain point. The lion was confused. How can these footprints just disappear? Is it a ghost? Is it a monster? And slowly, he searched around to see if these footprints went back outside, but didn't find any. Finally, he looked up. When he looked up, he found a man, a human being, sitting, but levitating. The lion thought, this man isn't normal. This man isn't a normal man. Not a human. But he looks human. But he can levitate. Is this possible? Can humans levitate? No, not all humans can levitate. So, this is a person who is not even scared of me. Everyone near the forest, everyone near my cave is scared. First thing in the morning when I roar, I can hear the birds fly away. I can hear even the, li even the elephants retreating. No human enters the forest. But yet this man, or this being, has entered and he is sitting peacefully, meditating. This can't be a normal person. This has to be someone very special. This is a deep, bright light emitting from his body. Even the darkest corners of the cave had a warm glow to it. There has to be something special about this person. There must be. Having thought that, the lion thought, that means this man is worthy. Worthy of what? He's worthy of my worship. Now think about that. Is everyone you worship worthy? Or are you worthy of your of worship as well? See, the lion didn't come in and see, oh look, it's the Buddha, I must worship him. No. The lion saw that this was someone special. And this person is worthy of my worship. Now check. Are you worthy of worship as well? Do you worship others because you have to or because you see qualities in them? See the good qualities that they have that makes them worthy of your worship. Now you can't say sorry and answer, no one is worthy of my worship because I'm so good. Obviously not. We're not perfect. If there's someone who you're going to worship, don't just don't worship them because you have to. Think about their qualities, at least one quality that makes them worthy of your worship. We get worthy of your worship, worthy of worship. Doing that, you should worship them. That worship is a true veneration. Not the fake ones where you just think you have to and so you do it. When you truly worship, you accumulate a lot of merit. So this lion thought that this Buddha, the lion didn't know it was the Buddha. But he saw that this being is worthy of my worship. This human being is worthy of my worship. So he went out, the lion, and went through the forest and looked for flowers. He went to the nearest watering hole. He went to the nearest stream. He went to the lakes and found lotuses. And so this lion decided, you know what, I'm going to pick these lotuses. Now, just take a moment to remember that this is a lion we're talking about. Lions don't have movable thumbs, right? So, this lion can't hold bunches of flowers. It can only hold, remember, lions can't even stand on their two feet. The animals that go on four. Because lion is picking these flowers using its mouth, being very, very careful not to harm the petals. And... It can only take one flower at a time, right? So he can only take one lotus from the lake. He takes one lotus and goes to the cave, drops it at the feet of the Buddha, 
and goes back. Again, picks a flower, goes back. Until all the perfect lotuses in the lakes, the rivers, the watering holes have all gone. Next, he goes to the bushes and picks other flowers, jasmines, uh, who knows what, daffodils, bluebells, some sort of flowers. The flowers are grown jungles, I don't know. But all these flowers, different colors, different types, different smells, and each of them, one by one, he picked, he picked the flowers and went into the cave and dropped it at the feet of the Buddha. Then what this lion did was, it went to the forest after collecting the last flower they can find, and using what it has, so its paws and its mouth and its face, it started to arrange the flowers in patterns, in styles, piling them up on top of each other until the last flower touched the Buddha's leg. So remember, the Buddha's meditating, sitting down, right? So until that level, that height, the lion had arranged these flowers. By then, it was most likely night time. And so what this lion did was, he used to stand there, guarding the Buddha, attending to all his needs. And then in the morning, without a, a blink of rest, about, without a wink of, of sleep, the lion removed all the flowers and again went in the forest and again collected flowers to make another one. When he's done, it's probably far into the night and so he stands there guarding and attending to the needs. And again, repeat. The lion did this not for one day, not for two, but for seven whole days. So on the eighth morning, the tired lion again removes all the flowers. You see, this lion is tired physically, but mentally, it's not tired. He will, he will do it again. But on the eighth morning, the Buddha wakes up from his meditation and comes back onto the ground. And the Buddha was getting ready to leave. Seeing this, the lion ran up to the Buddha, circled him three times, and finally bowed and worshipped him. The Buddha, using his divine eyes, so tried to see if this was enough merit for this lion to go into the heavenly plains. If the lion was able to go to this Sugati, in confirming the fact that this lion had a lot of merit, the Buddha decided it was time for him to leave. So what the lion did was, the lion ran ahead of the Buddha and using his paws, opened the door, the entrance of the cave and stepped aside for the Buddha to exit. But every step the Buddha took, the lion's heart got heavier and heavier. And then the Buddha Using his powers, he made his way to the monastery. Seeing the Buddha disappear into the distance, the lion couldn't handle it. The lion's heart couldn't handle seeing the Buddha disappear out of his sight. In that moment, the lion's heart split. Split into two. Split from the grief, the sorrow. In that moment, he died. But in an instance, he was born in... He was reborn as a human this time. Again, at the time of the Buddha Padmuttara. So, the Buddha Padmuttara's ministry hasn't ended yet. And he was born in the city of Hansavati, in a very rich family. And due to all the merits he had accumulated, he lived a very happy life. He had money, he had friends, he had everything he wanted. But mostly he had the merits to listen to the Buddha's preachings. So every single day he would go to 
see the Buddha. But the thing is, he never went alone. He never went by himself to see and listen to the Buddha's Dharma. He would always go with a friend, with a family, with even with random villagers. Anyone he could bring, who, who he can bring. Because he knows that this is the right path. I can't go alone and do this selfishly. He took the selfless path. Being selfless, he would invite others to come with him. He never went alone. He'll go, he'll go to the monastery where the Buddha had resided and he would listen to the Dharma. Maybe he didn't understand it completely, but he would go. One day, he went, to, he went with some villagers to the monastery and that day was a special day because one of the monks, the Buddha, was giving him a title. Giving him the title of the foremost monk who utters pians of joy. Hearing this, this young man felt very happy for some reason. He didn't understand why. But what he did was, he wanted to give alms to the Buddha and the Mahasangha. So he went to the Buddha and requested, and the Buddha accepted. But he didn't give alms for one day, not two days, seven days in a row to the Buddha and the Mahasangha, accumulating incalculable amount of merits. Now, it's almost like uh, you getting a genie who gives you three wishes. But instead of three, only one and there's no genie. You could ask for pretty much anything. So if there was a magic lamp and a genie who can give you one wish, what would you wish for? Money, a happy family, a faithful wife, husband, a good job, birth in the heavenly planes, birth in rich families, what would you ask for? On the seventh day of giving alms, this young man went to the Buddha and said, O Venubhusa, the Supreme Buddha, you see, Buddha, I don't want any of this merit for my pleasure. I've, I don't want any of this, uh, this merit to help me go into the heavens. I don't want to be, be born rich. I don't want any of that. I want one thing. I want to become an Arahat. Who, if you remember, seven days ago, you gave the title... The, the, the foremost monk who utters peans of joy, I want to be like him. And so the Buddha, using his divine eye, looked into the future and said to this young man, Young man, your wish will happen. In another hundred thousand eons, there will be a Buddha called Buddha Gautama. And in his ministry, you will be called Pindola Bharadwaja. And you will be the foremost monk who utters paeans of joy. And so, that moment, he, he was filled with happiness. He was filled with all of these expectations that I will do this. I will become the foremost in uttering paeans. And so what he did was he again started to give, again started to become more and more and more selfless, giving, helping, etc, etc, etc. I want to take a slight detail from here. How would you feel if someone told you, you will attain, you will become an arahat in a hundred and a and hundred thousand eons? Some of you will be like, wow, that, that they are prophesizing my arahatship. I will become an arahat. But look at the time. 100,000 eons. I don't know about you, but I can't wait that long. I don't have that much compassion to wait that long. 
hundred thousand eons. Right. So this young man died at a very old age of doing many merits. And due to this, he was born in the heavenly plains and never fell into the hells. So he lived most of his life in the heavenly plains and lived life in luxury as humans. Until his last birth, where he was born in Mahasara clan. He was son to the cha chaplain of the king. He was called Prince Bharadwaja. You see, this prince was very smart, very clever. He could learn things very quickly. When others were still learning their ABCs, he probably went further, learning to read. He caught things quickly. And so when he went to school, he would be the top in his class and he would skip years. So at a very young age, he would go here to went to university and he would learn the three Vedas faster than most others. He excelled in the three Vedas. He became a Brahmin at a young age. But this Brahmin wasn't satisfied with his life. He wanted to go further. He wanted to not keep his knowledge. He wanted to spread this knowledge. Spread it with as many people as possibly can. So he went to teach. So from Brahmin to teacher. In no time he found 500 students. Faithful students who would learn the Vedas as well. But you see, the Brahmin Bharadwaja was very selfish as well. He absolutely adores food. Whenever they went on a trip or whenever they found an open alms giving hall, they would go to it. And this prince would go and take everything for himself. He believed that all this food was for him. Like I said, when everyone went on a trip, the first thing he would ask is, where's the food? Where is the food? Did you guys bring food? Or his mind was just food, food and more food. If there was no food, he would ask, okay, if there's no food, at least where is the soup? If there was no food, he would ask for soup. The Brahmin Bharadwaja was very greedy. Never satisfied. He was a glutton. Soon he got a nickname. So, in Pali, Pinda means rice or food. And Lol means, not laugh out loud, it means to love. Now everyone used to call him Pindola because he loves food, Pindola. Pindola Bharadwaja. You see, no matter how much he did, no matter how much he ate, no matter how much he taught, he was really not really satisfied. No matter how much he ate, no matter how much he taught others, he was never satisfied. There was something missing. There was a hole. There was a hole in his heart that he couldn't fill. But one day, he went to the city of Rajagaha and, and due to his luck, due to all of his merits, he was able to meet the Buddha. The Buddha was able to preach to him and after listening to one sermon, he found that life was useless, that the life he's living is useless, he's never satisfied that he wanted to ordain. Now, quick question. By shaving your hair and wearing robes, does that mean all of your habits and attachments disappear? No. So, like you remember Venerable Sona, the story of Venerable Sona, she had, very, she had a lot of habits that she couldn't stop immediately. And Venerable Pindola Bharadwaja was very greedy. And even as a monk, he was still like that. But yet, after understanding that his greed was causing him a lot of suffering, that there was no point of 
being greedy, after listening to the Dharma, after having associated all of his noble friends, the Kalyana Mitras, in no time he became an Arhat. Now he could feel that, you know, that hole in the heart that we mentioned earlier? It was filled. He was now satisfied. He had found what he's been looking for. The moment he became an Arhat, he went from school to school, temple to temple, town to town, exclaiming how happy he was, exclaiming that I understand the Dharma. I understand the Dharma. I have eradicated all my defilements. So, if you have a question about the Dharma, if you need help, I am here to help you. I can help you. Now, he, due to his, the happiness that he felt, this everlasting happiness, this unconditional happiness, he would used to go place to place saying that I have found it. I can help you find it as well. Uttering peans to a lot of people. Peans of joy. Even when he confronted the Buddha, this unconditional happiness made him tell the Buddha, Oh, Venerable I understand the Dharma. I have eradicated my defilements. But no matter what, some people held views that they knew who Venerable Pimnola Bharadwaja was back as in his late life. Back when he didn't understand the Dharma, knowing that he was very greedy. So even one day, a friend, a friend who, who held wrong views, Mitcha Dusti, who was also very greedy, went to see his friend, and both Hindula Bharadwaj. And so the Venerable preach to his friend about the, the benefits of giving alms and giving. So he was preaching about being selfless, but he was preaching that to someone who is extremely selfish. So this greedy Brahmin thought, you know what, he's just trying to take my money, he's just trying to take my food. Remember, he used to be very greedy. Probably he couldn't find much food when he, as, as a monk. And so he's asking me for good food. Ah, uh, you know what? I'm not going to fall for his trick. He's not going to, he, he, he's trying to trick me. I'm not going to fall for that. You know, instead, I'm going to give him one arms. I make him happy because he used to be a friend, right? But then, Venerable Pindola Bharadwaja exclaimed, Oh, but, dear friend, don't give it to me. Don't offer the arms to me. Offer it to the Mahasanga. Friend, offer your arms to the Mahasanga. Offer it to the Venerable Sariputta. Offer it to all these Arhats, the Buddha. You don't need to offer it to me. Now, this man was surprised. What? To offer it to you, then why are you telling me to do this? He thought. There must be something different. There's something that he couldn't understand. So he asked the Venerable Sir, saying, Oh Venerable Sir, I thought you were asking me to give because I thought you were very greedy and, no, and you don't get fed well and you wanted to eat good food for once. Venerable Pindal, Venerable, the Venerable Pindola Bharadwaja replies, Dear friend, before I eat any meals, before I take shelter in any residence, under any shelter, under a roof, before I wear my robes, before I take medicines, I reflect on what I do. And so he explains, before I take a meal, I contemplate on why. 
So in Pali, he recites, Pati Sankha Yoniso, Pindapatam Pati Sevami, Neva Dvaya, Namadaya, Namandanaya, Navi Bhusanaya, Yava Deva Imasa Kaya Satitya, Yapanaya Vihin Suparatya, Brahmacharya Nugraya, Itipurana Chavedana, Pati Hankami, Navan Chavedana, Na Upade Sami, Yatra Chame Bhavisati, Anavajita Pahasu Viharo Chati. Which meant, wisely reflecting, I use his food not for fun, not for pleasure, not for fattening, not for beautification, only for the maintenance and nourishment of this body, keeping it healthy and helping me on my journey with my spiritual life. Thinking thus, I don't overeat, and so I so I may continue to live at ease. Now hearing this, he was gobsmacked. He was surprised, speechless in fact. His friend who would go anywhere and ask for food, first thing he would ask was for food. He was always hungry. But now he says, I don't take this for pleasure, not for fun. Not for beauty, not for main, just not for fattening, just for maintenance of this body. His friend, you can always imagine, stood there staring at him. And finally, when he came back to his senses, he said, Venerable sir, let me, please let me offer offer an alms to you. Alms to the Mahasanga. Please, tomorrow, can you please come to my house? And let me offer arms. Now the question is, do you do the same? Do you eat for the fun of it? Like, you know, for bites? Are you eating for the maintenance of your body? Are you eating for the fun or the pleasure? Or because you know, you're, want to eat so you can build up fat, so you can... Go to the gym the next day to burn it all off to build muscle. Or are you eating certain types of food just to make you more beautiful? Are you forgetting the fact that food was made, was made for you to maintain your body? To give you nourishment? To keep you alive? It's a medicine. Medicine for the illness or the disease of hunger. It's used just to keep us healthy. To keep us healthy so we can go on the path without pain of overeating, pain in the future like when we don't have food to be, stop us being hungry then as well. Why do you take food? Look how the Dharma has changed a person. Someone who is very greedy who couldn't stand the sight of food. If there was food, it's like it was basically like if food was there, Pindola Bharadwaja was there. Anywhere there's food, he was there. But now, none of that mattered. He only took food for his body. Look how much that changed him. You see, the Venerable Pindola Bharadwaja, one day the, the, the Buddha saw him sitting not so far away, sitting cross legged. Under a tree, a forest dweller, a monk that goes on arms and only takes from door to door, who wears robes made of rags, who is an owner of only one set of three robes, a man with, full, with few wishes, who is content with his life, who can live in solitary, who has untangled himself from Sansara, untangled himself from the old defilements, who has devoted himself into a higher mind, seeing that the Buddha showed his disciple, monks, look at that monk, Vedru Pindola Bharadwaja, and recites Aradampadagata, Anupuadu Anupugatu. 
ಪ್ರಾತಿಮೋಕ್ಷೆಗಸಾಂಗಿಮೋಕ್ಷೆಕ್ಷೆಕ್ಷೆಕ್ಷೆಕ್ಷೆಕ್ಷೆಕ್
felt ashamed, almost disgusted with her actions. Stood there staring at the monk. The others were still playing, but when they noticed one of them, one of the wives were silent, not playing, staring. They also looked at what she was staring at and saw that the venerable Hindula Bharadwaja was meditating, who was distanced, who refrained from sensual pleasures, sitting under the sadri, meditating. Each of the women were so ashamed of themselves. And so each of them, they decided that they would like to hear the Dharma. Decided to go to the Venerable Sir and sit around him. And so by that time, Pindola Bharadwaja, the Venerable Pindola Bharadwaja, the Venerable Pindola Bharadwaja had woken up from his meditation and saw these people come crowd around him to listen to him preach. So he started to preach. But remember the one wife who had uh, the king's head rested on her lap? She started to become jealous. She started to think, oh gosh, all of them started to play and now they're sitting around this monk listening to a sermon. Oh my god, how am I so un how, how am I so unfortunate? How can they do this to me? It could have been the other it could have been her, it's her turn. It's her turn to for her, to have the king's head rest on her lap. Ah, oh, it's just because the king favours me, I think. But that's still not fair though. And so what she did was she shook her lap. And the king jolted awake. And the king, when the king woke up, he looked around, seeing that none of his wives are around him. They all left. And so he asked the one wife who stayed behind, Where are the others? Where are those women? And so the wife replies, ah, That's what I've been telling you. They've gone to that monk over there. And look, they're playing and joking with him. Look, they're giggling with him as well. They're laughing. The king suddenly stood up. Where is that lecherous, bald-headed monk? Like a mad elephant, started to make his way to the monk. Now, back in the palace, when the king entered the room, and when uh, someone noticed his present, everyone would stand up to show respect. But unfortunately, when the king was seen by some of the women, some of his wives, none of them stood up due to the fact that they are listening to the Dharma and they didn't want to disturb the monk, none of them stood up. Now, that was like adding straw onto fire. And now this king became more angry. And so he went straight into the middle of the crowd, in the gathering, and told the monk, You lecherous monk! What are you doing with my women? I am not doing anything. I was resting under this tree when these women surrounded me to ask uh, to listen to my preachings. What rest are you taking with these women? The venerable replied, saying, "I am preaching to I am preaching to them the Dharma." The king thought that, you know, I am the king. I am the king of the country. You are in my country. How dare you do this? And he thought, I must do something. I must show that I have power over him. I must retaliate. And so, using it, through his anger, he started to stomp his way straight to the, the, the Ashoka tree nearby, to a storm to an Ashoka tree nearby. Now in this tree, 
there was a nest of red ants. The king, using a stick, poked this nest and tried to catch it before it fell onto the floor. He tried to pick it so he can throw it onto this monk, onto the venerable Pindola Bharadwaja. But when he poked it with a stick, it came loose and it fell onto his body. And so these red, these red ants started to bite, started to sting. And so the king ran around, wiping himself, getting rid of all these ants. But no matter what he did, his anger didn't fade. He had a grudge and this grudge wasn't going to end this quickly. After wiping every single ant off of him, he went straight to the tree again and tried again. He had quite some perseverance, right? He tried again, tried to get another nest and again the same thing happened. The nest again fell onto him. But this time, there was a lot more ants. Screaming, this king started to run around. Some of these these wives were trying to suppress their laughter, seeing that the king do be like that. But if the king heard, some of them may even lose their heads. So trying to suppress their laughter. So some of them stood up and tried to help the king. But the venerable Hindula Bharadwaja saw that if he stayed longer, this king would do more demerit. That would help. That will make him, will give him birth in the woeful plains, in the hells. So, the venerable Hindula Bharadwaja stood up and, using his supernatural powers, levitated and went away. Seeing this, the king's harem, harem started to cry, started to shout, saying, "Oh, you king!" You awful king, why did you threaten to throw red ants' nest at the monk? That's the wrong thing to do, you should know that. Usually people would go to these monks and, and throw flowers at them, offer arms, but you decide you're not going to throw flowers, you decide you're going to throw red ants? Do you know how much demerit you're accumulating? Hearing this, the king came back to his senses. All of his anger subdued, disappeared. He came back to his senses, realized what sort of, what sort of deed he, is, he was about to do and the amount of demerit he has accumulated. So the king sent guards, sent gardeners, all of them to look for this monk. Now you tell me, right? Now let's say, say someone blamed you for something that you haven't done, that you're not even involved with. And every time uh, you defend yourself, they're like, you know what, you're lying and stuff like that. No matter what you say, according to them, you're lying. And so once that was over, you left. And then they called you back saying, Oh, you know what? I made a big mistake. Uh, Mr. Mrs. Madam Sir, Madam Friend, Mate, uh, I'm sorry. Can you forgive me? Now, the obvious answer is yes. But I'm not asking what you're going to say. I'm asking about what's going through your mind. Are you thinking, I told you so. You should know. You should listen to me. But... I, I'm gonna forgive you. Are you thinking I can't forgive you? How could you do something like that? You should be listen. You should have listened to me at least a bit, and none of this would have happened. Whatever you're thinking, that is not what the venerable Pindola Bharadwaja thought. Even though this king tried to throw nests of red ants. In case you don't know how it, what, what it feels like to be bit by red ants. Just imagine, it hurts. 
But when the king sends uh, sends these guards and gardeners and all these people to look for him, and when they find him, he came straight back to the garden. And of course, he didn't think twice before accepting his apology, forgiving him completely. He forgave. He, he forgave the king using his full heart. See, even after uh, after a few days in the town of Kosambi, venerable. Pindola Bharadwaja resided at a monastery called Gosita. And this king wanted to meet him again. Remember, he had not a single grudge. The past is in the past. Nothing is affecting him. He's not judging the king anymore. When they say never judge a book by its cover, an arahat doesn't judge at all. So this king goes to the venerable Pindola Bharadwaja, Bharadwaja, goes to the king, the king goes to the venerable Pindola Bharadwaja and asks, um, asks the venerable sir, why do monks observe the precepts? Why do they refrain from sensual pleasures? You're so young and you could enjoy all of this pleasure. And you all are still in your youth. You could have wives, many wives. You can live happily, have as much food as you want. Why do you observe still? And so, Venerable Pindola Bharadwaja explains, we treat mothers like mothers, daughters like daughters, sisters like sisters. We treat them like people. We treat them like they are. We follow these precepts to shield us. And you call us young, right? Our body is basically a machine. Our body is made up of all these parts. And he starts to explain about kind of asana, contemplation on the body. Hearing this, the king knelt down, worshipped the venerable sir, and from that day onwards he became a pasika. Wait, just before we carry on, if the king became an Upasika, doesn't that mean the title Upasika is higher than a king? It's like an update, not a downgrade. So, if you can call yourself an Upasika, you are greater than any king or queen that they ever lived. If the king upgraded to be an Upasaka, that means if you're an Upasaka, you are, you are an upgrade. You are higher or much more valuable than a king. But back in those times, Especially in the town Rajagaha, many people were confused. Because 9 times out of 10, the ascetics who knock on their doors claim that they're arahats, claim that they have supernatural powers. And so some of them ask for money, some of them ask for food. And due to the respect that these people have to arahats, they would instantly offer anything. Many people would announce that they're arahats, that they have powers, they can do all this. Some of them would knock on people's door and say, 
I am an arhat and when when they ask for something, say for example food, and when the householder says, sorry, Ganabusa, we don't have food, this arhat becomes angry and storm off. Wow, this so-called arhat. Day by day became a, a bigger problem. People didn't know if people were arhats or not. And so one day, a baron went into a, a baron got a gift. A block of red sandalwood. An expensive type of wood. So he was also confused. Because he's rich, right? A lot of people knocked on his door and said, I'm an arahat, give me some money, give me this, give me that. And you to his respect, he would do it. But then he got suspicious, seeing that some of them didn't act like arahats. So using this red sandalwood, he carved an arms ball and placed this arms ball on top of a very, very tall bamboo stick. And then he sent people, sent messengers out far and wide saying, if there is any arhats out there, come take this arms ball made of red sandalwood. If you can take it, it's all yours. Red sandalwood was very expensive and very rare. To have, uh, to have an arms ball made of sandalwood would have cost millions, maybe even trillions. So you can imagine the next day, the Baron, in early in the morning, he has a knock on the door. He opens it and he's an ascetic. And the ascetic proclaims, I am thy arhat. Please give me thy arms ball. And so this baron replies, Venerable sir, if you are a so-called arahat, be my guest. Levitate with your supernatural powers and retrieve this arms ball. I shall show thee. And the Aztec would run away. Because he was neither an arahat and neither had supernatural powers. <laughs> so the the door of this baron became crowded. A lot of people came to see this arms ball and a lot of ascetics and monks would come proclaiming that they're arahats. Each time they asked, he would say the same thing. If you want, be my guest. Go up there and get the arms ball. But no one had the powers to do it. But back in those times, a religious re leader called Nigandhanath Buddha, he was a naked ascetic and he was very famous. He was also a so-called Arahat. He pretended that he was an Arahat, but he was also very mischievous, very cunning. He said he, he wanted this arms ball and so he told his students, Students! Let us go, let us go to Rajagaha, to this baron's house, where I have heard that he has let anyone who can get, his, get this arms ball made of red sandalwood, if they can go and get it. So, let's devise a plan. So students, before I go and ask for this arms ball, I need you students to go to this baron and tell the baron that, you know, my teacher is an arahat, please give this, this arms ball is that yeah, he deserves this arms ball and tell this baron how great I am and he'll surely give it and so Nigandhanath Buddha and his students went to the house of the baron and the students went to this baron and said baron our teacher is an arahat. Our teacher has a lot of powers. He deserves his arms ball, so can you please give it to him? This baron, because think about it, many Aztecs have come to his house and asked the same thing. And so, almost very monotonously or in a very dull way, said, if your teacher is an arahat, tell him to come and take the arms ball and he can have it. So students, disappointed, went back to their teacher and told
told the teacher what happened. And so he goes to plan B. So this time the teacher, Nigandanath Buddha, went to his bar and said, This is I. I am an Arhat. I can fly and take his arms ball. The Baron is probably very bored. Okay then, if you are Arhat, be my guest, go take it. And then all of his students started to run. Ran at the teacher and held his arms and legs. Saying, oh teacher, don't show, don't show your supernatural powers. Don't show that you're an arhat for such an uh, invaluable piece of wood. Don't do it. So, so Nigantanandha Buddha turned to face the Baron and said, Baron, see my students are not letting me go. So instead of me showing you the supernatural powers, it's kind of easier if you just gave me the ball. But the Baron didn't give up that easily. Now he was, he was amused that all the students did this. So now he was he, he, he was a bit more energetic about this. Okay then, oh great teacher, if you want it, there's only one way you can do it. You can only, the only way is someone has to fly up there and get an armful. But this time, he went for plan C. Okay then. There's no need to threat. There's no need to be scared. I'm going to get his arms ball. So uh, I need you to give me some space. Everyone back up a bit. It's going to take a bit of space. And I looked up to the arms ball. Put his two hands up. It's almost stretched a bit. And then started to shout. I'm going to go and at that moment all his students started to run and grab his arms, leg, legs and pushed him over saying, oh teacher don't, don't show your supernatural powers for such, so, something so small, something so irrelevant, it's so invaluable, you can't show your arhat, arhatness, arhatship for something so small and so the, the, the Nigandanatha Buddha stood up, again faced the Baron, looking at him saying, Look, my students are not letting me fly. Why he's, and he's wiping uh, his body, from, he's wiping the sand off his body and rubbing his back because he, he was pushed to the floor, saying, Look, Baron, my students are not letting me fly. So, can you find a way to bring that ball down? How is this? You can imagine this baron almost laughing. <laughs> then, uh, oh, sir, I can't get it down. Someone has to go fly, has to fly and bring it down. Plan A, B, and C. Three of them didn't work. Nigal Dhanadu Buddha lost. Had lost it. He couldn't fly up to get the ball and couldn't trick the Baron. So, humiliated. You can imagine him, him saying, Okay students, I, 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 I agree. This ball is no, has no value. Let's leave. Let's go. And humiliated, he leaves the house. Seven days pass. Not a single ascetic could get the arms ball. At that moment, people used to go around now sad, sulking almost, because they couldn't find a single arhat who could take his ball. Some of them thought, you know what, arhats don't don't exist anymore. No one could get his ball. And so whenever, now, whenever people saw Aztecs, they started to laugh, saying, ah ha ha, there you go, that's one of the Arhats, or so-called Arhats. They can't even get a ball from the, the Baron. So one day, on the seventh day, 
Venerable Pindula Bharadwaja was robing on top of a rock. And a group of a group of people were passing below it. And he heard them talking about there's no Arabs in the whole of the country, maybe the whole world. So the, the Venerable Mahamogalana heard this as well and told Venerable Pindola Bharadwaja, you see what people are now talking about. They are, they are saying that there's no Arhats anymore. We have to do something about it. The Venerable Pindola Bharadwaja replies, uh, Venerable Sir, you're the one with the, the greatest, second to the Buddha with supernatural powers. You should go and show them that there still are Arhats. Inspire them. That there still are Arhats in the world. Inspire them. Bhagavad Muhammad Ghanani exclaims, But everyone knows about me. But no one, not many people know about you. The great Arhat Moggalani tells Venerable Pindola Bharadwaja to go and collect the arms law. So, at that moment, Venerable Pindola Bharadwaja went into the fourth Samadhi. And using his powers, he enlarged this rock. And he balanced it on the tip of his foot. Using his supernatural powers, he made himself invisible and carrying the rock on the tip of his foot, he went around the city Rajagaha seven times. The people in Rajagaha were going along with their business. They don't know that anything is happening until a massive shadow appears. It's almost like the sun had disappeared. People looked up and saw a massive rock floating in the sky. People were confused. And then when they noticed it was a massive rock, people became scared. People started to run and scream. It was chaos. The people of Rajagaha thought that someone has done something very wrong and so a rock is going to hit them and it was going to destroy the city. Some people thought that it's going to kill them all. It's, an, it's, it's a meteorite maybe. Everyone's running here and there. People hiding, looking at, the, at this rock between their fingers. And then after seventh time, the Venerable Pindola Bharadwaja appeared. People were relieved. Phew! Oh my god, we were all scared that the rock will crush us whole. Oh Venerable Sir, please don't let go of the rock. Hold that very tightly. It will kill us all maybe. If you don't, don't, just don't let go. And so, the Venerable Pindola Bharadwaja kicked the stone up and then kicked it back into the place it was at first. And then at that moment he appears right next to the arms ball. Now do you remember the Baron who requested anyone who is an Arahat to go up and get the arms ball? To the Venerable Pindola, to the Venerable Pindola Bharadwaja, he did the complete opposite. Oh, Venerable Sir, please can you come down? So the Venerable Sir, collecting the arms ball, came back to the floor, the ground. Came back to the ground. And the Baron came running with a cup of water, washed his feet, worshipped him. Worshipped him and gave him arms. People were cheering, people were shouting, celebrating that Arhats are still out there. They've got amazing powers. Do you see that? It was like a meteorite circling around the, the town seven times. Like, I almost had a died from a heart attack. But people were, were celebrating, finding there are arhats. People were so happy that they were almost partying on the street. So, Venerable Pindola Bahadwaja, after collecting the arms ball and ha after having his meal, started make his way to the monastery where the Buddha re resided in. So he took to the air and started to make his way. People followed him. There was a parade behind him. People shouting, screaming, dancing in the monastery. 
The Buddha heard slight rumble, almost like an earthquake, which got louder and louder and louder. He asked Venerable Ananda, Ananda, what is that noise? And Venerable Ananda went to see what it was and came back saying, Oh, Venerable Sir, Venerable Pindola Bharadwaja had gone to collect the red, the red wood, the red sandalwood arms ball. He had shown the town the supernatural powers. Now the town is cheering. They're, they're, they're celebrating the fact that there are still arahats in the world. And so the Buddha told Ananda to tell Venerable Pindola Bharadwaja to come and see him. When the Venerable Pindola Bharadwaja arrived, the Buddha asked Pindola Bharadwaja, Did you do this? and explained the situation. And the Venerable Pindola Bharadwaja said, Yes, I did that. I, I went and collected the alms bowl and showed everyone that there are still arahats in the world. And then the Buddha said, why did you go and demonstrate iridhi for something so small, something so trivial, something so, so that has so little value? It is almost like a prostitute showing off her naked self for very little cash, very little money. So from today forth, no one shall use wooden arms ball. And today forth, no one shall show, shall demonstrate their supernatural powers or their iridhi for personal gains. Well, to be honest, if the Buddha told that to me, I don't know how I would have coped. It's pretty lucky that he was an arahat or I know I wouldn't I don't know how he would have coped. Saying it's almost like a prostitute showing off her naked body for very for li very little money. You can rephrase that in how however you want, but <laughs> I don't know how someone someone who's not arahat could have coped. But no matter what. The Venerable Pindola Bharadwaja in the Jeta's Grove Monastery was given the title by the Buddha. So the Buddha gathered a crowd, gathered his his monks and said and announced that the foremost monk in uttering pians of joy is my son, Venerable Pindola Bharadwaja. Pindola Bharadwaja, he went town to town, school to school, temple to temple, monastery to monastery, giving pians of joy, saying things like, I have realized the truth. I have I have, cultiva I have cultivated the three controlling faculties, mindfulness, concentration, and insight. This accomplished the destruction of birth, old age, and, the, and death. And many peons of joy. He was full of unconditional happiness. Nothing can condition his happiness. So look how lives change. Lives change from someone greedy to someone who utters pains of joy. Remember, as quickly as that, let's have a quick summary of all of his life. As a lion, he knew how to worship. He knew that he should that the person should be worthy of worship, that he should see equality before worshipping. As a young man, the rich young man, 
She was determined to become an arahat. May all these merits for I don't want these merits for pleasure. I don't want these merits to be born in the heavens. I want this to become an arahat. He had turned all of his merits from seven days of giving alms to one point. Nibbana. And that's what he got. And as a greedy man, he became a person who utters peons of joy. I hope, I hope you'll be able to utter peons of joy. That you'll, you'll feel this happiness of the same happiness that the Venerable Pindol Bharadwaja felt. And so you'll utter the same thing. You'll utter peons of joy, saying that I've eradicated all my defilements. I, have, I am no longer prone to old age, death, birth after this. I understand Dharma. If you need help, ask me. I'll help you. I'll show you the path. Remember, he never went alone when he listened to a sermon. He always took a friend or a villager or someone with him. After learning the three Vedas, he didn't keep the knowledge for himself. He gave the knowledge. Giving knowledge, well, if you give, you want to receive. He gave the best he knew and he received the best. This was the story of the Venerable Pindola Bharadwaja. I hope you're able to get some qualities and I hope you're able to put these qualities in your life, making you closer to your destination. All right. Before we conclude, let's take a few moments to transfer merits and then conclude them. Let's transfer all the merits we've acquired by making offerings to the infinite virtues of the Noble Triple Gem, chanting Birat, and listening to the Dharma and engaging in various meritorious deeds today. So first and foremost, let's remind ourselves how incredibly fortunate we are to be in receipt of the Lord Buddha's teaching. And with immense gratitude, let's transfer these merits to the Bhikshu Bhikshunis, Upasakas Upasakas, who since time immemorial have protected and preserved the sublime teaching of the Buddha, and pass it down to noble generations of the noble lineage in the form of Tripitaka, which is thankfully available to us today to study, to understand, to comprehend the Dharma. Let us also transfer these merits that are required to all the members of the Mahasangha present throughout the world, including the chief prelates of all the chapters, who have dedicated their lives to a noble path and committed themselves to the betterment of all sentient beings. Let us not forget them, among them are the monks and nuns raising your local temple and nunneries, who have always been by your side through thinking thing, thing come rain or shine. Let us also transfer these merits to good and nuances. And all the other monks resident in this monastery, as well as the Anagarikas, the Anagarikas attached to the monastery. Let us all take a moment to transfer these merits and express our gratitude to those who make great efforts to disseminate the teachings of the Buddha, be that by transliterating these sermons, sharing them out with others, inviting others to join them, may through the power of these merits, if any of them have, if, if any of them have been born in the upper plane, may they redeem themselves and be, and be born in the blissful plane, may through the power of these merits, may they abstain from the meritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble way forward path, and attain the supreme listening bar. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us all transfer merits and quiet to our devotees, friends of the monastery, who for sake of merits continue to sustain the Mahasangha. This includes everyone, from those of you who contributed to the construction of the monastery, to those of you who provide the Mahasangha with shelter, arms, robes, medicines, as well as those who pass on their know-how, extended their well wishes. Excuse me. May the power of these merits, may they abstain from non meritorious deeds, before the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble effort path and attain supreme Muslim in Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let's all take a moment to transfer merits to our mothers, fathers, husbands and wives, brothers, sisters, sons and daughters, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, nieces, nephews, our elders, friends and acquaintances, employers, employees, and to those who have helped us, support us, assist us in any way, shape or form. By the power of these merits, may they be healed in it by any physical or mental elements, may they overcome any obstacles in their spiritual progress, may they abstain from the meritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble way forward path and attain supreme in Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us all take a moment to transfer merits of devas, brahmas, spirits and demons, primarily the sacro deva as well as the numerous gods and deities who have committed to respect them and fulfill the sambhu this afternoon. Let us also transfer merits to our garden deities who keep a watchful eye over us and keep us out of harm's way. May through the power of these merits, May they prosper in divine power and wisdom. May they abstain from the meritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble way forward path, and attain supreme wisdom. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us all take a moment to transfer merits to our ancestors who predecease who predece who predece us. 
to those of you who've been our family who are the, to those of you who've been our family friends and acquaintances in the evening long journey sansara who helped us support us assist us in any way they could let's transfer these merits as well transfer merits to the members of the armed forces there was a police force who have sacrificed their lives to protect the peace and harmony of our nation when you all those who lost their lives in the war be their friend or foe rejoice in the merits we acquired today as well take a moment to transfer merits to those who have lost their lives in natural calamities such as tsunamis earthquakes landslides pandemics reminding ourselves that among them will be those who have been our fam- friends and families in the long journey sansara Let's take a moment to transfer merits to them. May the power of the merits, if any of them have been, born, have been born in the willful plane, may they redeem themselves being born in the willful plane. May they abstain from the meritorious deed, fulfill the meritorious deed, fulfill no way for the path, and attain the supreme Muslim bond. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Finally, let us resolve, may through the power and blessing of all the merits we acquire today, we be a witness to the event of many hundreds of thousands of arahats in this blessed land. And finally, may the power and all the merits we acquired today, you and I and everyone who made this program a success, become our Arhat Nwansi or Arhat Mihin Nwansi in this very life in the ear of the God the Supreme Buddha itself. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. May no Chubba Jem be with you. We will now conclude the Sambhu there. May no Chubba Jem be with you.